I want to welcome everyone to our teaching service today from Ephraim's Light Assembly. Today is September the 5th, 2020. The title of our teaching today is No Excuses Accepted. My name is Frank Smith and I'm the founder and senior pastor of Ephraim's Light Assembly. Our message today comes from Leviticus chapter 4. If you will turn in your Bibles, pick it up at verse 13, we'll read verse 22 and then verse 27. If the entire Israelite community sins by violating one of the Lord's commandments, but the people don't realize it, they are still guilty. Verse 22. If one of Israel's leaders sins by violating one of the commandments of the Lord his God, but doesn't realize it, he is still guilty. And verse 27. If any of the common people sin by violating one of the Lord's commandments, but they don't realize it, they are still guilty. Now, I want to start this message by just getting everybody on the same page of music, so to speak, or the same line of thinking. There's a disaster coming to America because too many people believe in a belief in God and have no understanding of Him. The carnal mind is enmity against God, which means our minds are maliciously against God. We need wisdom. Wisdom is the way of the Lord. But what is the way of the Lord? Yeshua said he came to show us how to fulfill the way of the Lord to be a living example for the commandments. In the Hebrew, he said he came to be the goal of the teaching and instruction of God, the written commandments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, we see an example of our minds being opposed to God's teaching. Paul said, But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now you can take Greeks here to mean those who are being grafted into God's kingdom of Israel. Paul's assigned mission from God was to bring non-Israelites into the kingdom of God. And as I've taught before, In order to understand God's word, we have to get away from thinking that Jew means Israel. It doesn't. It means one tribe, the tribe of Judah. Israel in the Bible can represent the nation of Israel or the kingdom of God, and most Bibles don't tell you the difference. Now, Yeshua gave a parable you can read for yourself in Luke chapter 14. It's in verses 16 through 24. It was about a certain man that planned a great banquet and invited many people. When the banquet was ready, the man sent his servants out to announce to those whom he had invited that all things were ready. Come, relax, have a good time, and eat. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone I know prepares a big wing dig with good food and good fellowship, I want to be there. So we can assume that people would want to attend this feast. If they were unable to attend, the polite thing to do was to let the host know at once. Now, to the surprise of the host, every person invited made an excuse as to why they could not attend, and it's clear from their excuses that they were uninterested and busy. One said that he had purchased some property and had to go look at it. Another had purchased some oxen and needed to go test them. And still, another one had gotten married. The master of the house was upset at their excuses, so he instructed his servants to go out quickly into the streets of the city to bring in the poor and the injured and the blind. Now, some of those who were invited did not think they deserved to be invited, and of course, they were reluctant to come. So when the servants had gathered those who came to the banquet room, it was still empty. So the host sent them back out into the highways and remote places, and he told them to compel people to come in. He sent them out to, so to speak, twist their arm. Now the host, in his frustration, swore that none of the first invitees would ever taste of the great food at the banquet because their excuses were bogus, they were inappropriate, ill-timed, and very unacceptable. He was angry because he felt none of them were justified in declining his invitation. Now, let's just draw a parallel here. Just think about our response to God's commandments to meet him at specific times. He instructed us to enjoy his presence on the Sabbath and the seven holy feast days that are to be observed in his kingdom forever. 
And we've sent him many excuses why we won't observe any of them. Now, the master of the universe has sent an invitation for us to come and know him better by meeting him at these times. However, Christianity has sent back lame, bogus excuses why we're busy on the Sabbath and we'll do it on the day we please, which is Sunday. We don't observe the feast days. Well, because we falsely accuse God of doing away with them and we're simply too busy to pray during the weekdays. The Lord has prepared a great banquet for us, but notwithstanding the fact that our Lord desires our presence at specific times that He ordained, we're too busy. The heavens and the earth declare His glory, but we're too busy. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, and the earth shows His handiwork. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20 For ever since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through His workmanship, all of His creation, the wonderful things that He has made, so that they who fail to believe and trust in Him are without excuse and without defense. There's that word excuse again. The truth is God's invitation to meet with him at certain times is ignored because we Christians want to do things our way. So we ignore the will of God and tell God what we want to do. This is a very dangerous practice considering the power and promises of the Almighty. If we observe Yeshua's life, we see that he practiced all the commandments of God, including the Sabbath and the feast days. In fact, Everything he did in his life honored these appointed times. If we want to be like Jesus, if we want to do what Jesus did, we're going to have to conform to the commandments of God. Mark chapter 6 verse 2. When the Sabbath came, Yeshua began to teach in the synagogue. And many who listened to him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, this knowledge and spiritual insight? What is this wisdom, this confident understanding of the scripture that he has been given and such miracles as these performed by his hands so there is the word wisdom god's way for man yeshua made no excuses because he knew that ignorance of god's commandments is no excuse god's will directs parents to raise their children in the commandments of the lord and that's for a reason so they will turn out right It seems as if most of us ignore that also. Now, Yeshua said that not everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be included in his kingdom. And this is in contrast to the fact that God is not willing that any should perish. Now, what joins these two statements lies within our person. There must be belief in Yeshua, Jesus Christ, and obedience to his commandments. I'll give you an illustration. We all get a lot of junk mail and advertisements. And we're used to getting coupons that get us a better price on things we want to buy. The kingdom of God does not come like free coupons in the mail. It is a covenant agreement between the maker and the created ones. Now, folks, I see a lot of people who equate going to church as salvation, but that's not true. Worshiping, which is studying the word of God, is the result of a belief in Christ and obedience to God's commandments. Assembling together should be the result of the commonality of loving Christ shared by a group of like-minded people who want to show their love to Him by obeying His commandments. Now the love of God is the common denominator that binds us together and it's the reason for obeying His commandments. In fact, we cannot obey Him unless we love Him. Love is reciprocal or it's not love. Proverbs 1 verse 22 How long, you whose lives have no purpose, will you love thoughtless living? How long will scorners find pleasure in mocking? How long will fools hate knowledge? The wisdom that God gives is not relying on a claim of ignorance as an excuse for not obeying the commandments because the results are harmful. It ends in misery and death. God's way of abundant life and blessing is readily available and accessible in His Word, in nature, and in the lives of the testimony of those who follow his instructions. The Bible says scorners delight in their scorning and that fools hate knowledge. Now I just have to say something here. 
I listen to a lot of messages from good people, good, good pastors during the week, but I am amazed sometimes at what a low level they're teaching at. It's no wonder God's people are perishing for lack of knowledge, so to speak. They're not getting taught. Now, there's two types of people here. This means that some of them, in their foolish ways, are not deliberate. They've not been taught the deep things of God. And now there are some who refuse God. They have a deeply ingrained stubbornness in their being, and they don't want to find God. But in Proverbs 1, verse 22, Solomon is talking to unconverted humanity who are under the rule of the prince and the power of the air, who has filled them with sin, filled them with rebellion and hatred of God. Now, the truth is that when we find ourselves ignoring or outright rejecting God's way of living, it's because Satan has convinced us that God's desires are not important. And this takes me back to the issue that Yeshua had with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he told them that their father was the devil because they had listened to his lies. They had lost their desire to submit to God. A new heart is available to those who have given up their way for God's way. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. God says, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. The amount of effort we put into seeking God is the amount of blessing we'll receive from our efforts. So prayer and Bible study is an absolute must for those who call themselves Christian those who follow Christ. When you commit to making changes in your life to purify your life, you will receive help from on high. James 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Now, the Hebrew word used in the original word of God for wisdom is chokmah, C-H-O-K-M-A-H, and it's translated as knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. Wisdom is the ability to determine what God's Word is telling us, how He's instructing us. God grants wisdom liberally to those who seek it. God's Word is wisdom, and it's profitable for a better life physically, spiritually, financially, and emotionally. He gives His wisdom freely and without judgment. Wisdom is understanding things from God's perspective. Turning your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. Now, it says there, Get skillfully and godly wisdom. Good advice. Acquire understanding. Actively seek spiritual discernment. Mature comprehension and logical interpretation. God says, Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. In Proverbs 19, verse 8. To acquire good sense is to love oneself. To treasure discernment is to prosper. And of course, discernment there means good judgment. Those who get the wisdom of God loves their life. Proverbs 8, verse 32 through 35. Now therefore, O sons, listen to me. For blessed, happy, prosperous, to be admired are they who keep my ways. Heed, that means pay attention to, Instruct and be wise and do not ignore or neglect it. Blessed, happy, prosperous to be admired is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorpost. For whoever finds me, and God is wisdom, finds life and obtains favor and grace from the Lord. Now, let me explain the word favor there. It means being in one accord, which is the relationship that we must have with God. It's a two-way street, a loving relationship where each party desires to please the other more than to please themselves. So we are to honor God's favor, which means being in one accord with Him above everything else, which means we make His kingdom and His way the goal for our life. If we can just understand his attitude and his character and adopt it for our own, all the good things he promises will be added to us. You'll find that in Matthew 6, verse 33. You see, the Lord blesses those who choose his way, and he surrounds them with his promises, which is our hedge of protection 
And it's called, of course, the Torah, the commandments of God. Isaiah 66 verse 2 says that God has caused all things to exist and that he gives them to those who honor his way because he's happy to join himself to those who love him. That means being in one accord. He wants to guide them, connect with them, and he wants to protect them. You'll find that in Psalms 37 verse 23 and Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. This doesn't mean we're free from the hardships of this world. It means that God provides his strength for us to endure those hardships. His amazing peace and his strength dwells within us, becomes part of our life. We are in one accord with him. God never leaves those who have joined themselves to him. He favors them, which means that he's in one accord with them and they're in one accord with him. His spirit is joined with our spirit and we have a peace that goes beyond all understanding. We have confidence that we are in the plan of God. Now, if you find yourself not joined with him and you want to accept his teaching and live your life a different way, Psalm 8611 is an excellent prayer to pray. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk and live in your truth. Direct my heart to fear your name with all inspired reverence and submissive wonder. And from Isaiah 41 verse 10, here is what God says to those who are in one accord with him. Do not fear anything, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Be assured I will help you. I will certainly take hold of you with my righteous right hand, a hand of justice, of power, and of victory, and of salvation. Now, it's amazing that once we accept God's way and we begin to serve Him, that we begin to see His blessings in situations that we just couldn't see before. There is no excuse for not knowing the commandments of God because He has established the world in such a way that we are blessed if we follow His way or we are fighting against the One who created the universe if we don't. God is present with all of His power and might to govern what He created. Ignorance can steal your soul because God will not accept it as an excuse. Back in Paul's day, people did not learn and they didn't keep their minds on the things of God. It seems that we've not progressed one inch in 2,000 years. God gives people over to the life they choose. Proverbs 4 verse 23. Above everything else, guard your heart, for it's the source of life's consequences. We need to drag America kicking and screaming back into God's kingdom because departing from God is going to prove disastrous for this nation. To whom much is given, much is required. And he's given us a lot, folks. In Paul's day, they practiced lesbianism, homosexuality, child sacrifice, and all the ways of life that were against God and against nature. Nothing's changed. The mind of man is just as depraved today as it was then. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. No one who abides in him, who remains united in fellowship with him, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin. No one who habitually sins has seen him or known him. Life without God is a foolish life indeed. Without wisdom and without knowledge and without protection, and without prosperity. God gave me a vision of a scroll with all the words of everyone in the world coming up before him. The words were flying through his sight, and they appeared in patterns before him. They were moving from right to left and from the bottom towards the top. At the same time his words were flying through the vision, they were being contrasted to the words of people. These patterns presented themselves as images of good and evil so that he knows the intent of every heart. He knows instantly when our words and deeds line up with his word and when they don't. He can see immediately any change in the direction of our souls. He processes everything instantly and it's stored in his mind. Hebrews 4 verse 12. See, the word of the Lord is alive. 
It is at work and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts right through to where the soul meets the spirit and joints meet the marrow. And it's quick to judge the inner reflections and attitudes of the heart. Folks, God's mind can read and store more information in a nanosecond than our computers can store in a thousand years. He is omnipotent, which means he has unlimited knowledge. He observes all things. He is omnipotent, which means he has unlimited power and authority. We live as if things are hidden. Well, they're not. Every thought, every intention, every deed is being recorded in his mind and it's being brought to light. Luke 8 verse 17, For nothing is hidden that will not be disclosed, nothing is covered up that will not be known and come out into the open. I was reading recently of what a new age person thinks about God. He gave all the credit for wisdom to man's brain and he said that the God of the Bible is false and that we've been brainwashed into thinking that God's talking to us when it's our own brain talking to us. He believes that we are self-sufficient and there is no God. I don't have time to tell you how many holes are in that argument, but I will tell you that the moment you die, your brain is useless, it's dead. The only things that are retained about you is in the spirit and the mind of God. He is all wisdom and life. If you live past physical death, you live in Him. He knows each person, and each person will be raised up before the Lord to give account of their life. Those who are found in the Lord will be raised up to eternal life. The others will be told to depart from His presence, where they will be eternally separated from Him and suffer the wages of sin for eternity. For those of his who have repented of their sins and fear him, he removes any record of their wrongdoings. Psalm 103, verses 6 through 12. Adonai brings vindication and justice to all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses, his mighty deeds to the people of Israel. Adonai is merciful. He's compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in grace. He will not always accuse. He will not keep his anger forever. He has not treated us as our sins deserve or paid us back for our offenses because his mercy towards those who fear him is as far as above earth as heaven. He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. In Acts 17 verse 30, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he's commanding all people everywhere to turn to him from their sins. Folks, everything comes from God. All that is known in science came from him. We need not worship science, but the creator who is the master scientist. God gave his people his language called Hebrew. In Hebrew, both the word for knowledge and science share the same root. And that root is yada, Y-A-D-A, as in information, which is mayada, M-A-Y-D-A, mayada. A word that has that in it is ish dayat, which means man of knowledge, and etz hadaat, tavara, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge, science, the knowledge of man and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are all linked. God is truly the origin of all wisdom. Judgment is not punishment. It's when all things are summarized, measured, and a verdict is revealed. Judgment's result is coupled to sowing and reaping. And this is the reason that the things God has forgiven do not appear in the judgment, for they're treated as if they never existed. And this is why repentance and a change in behavior is so important. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says, Every one of us will have to give an account of himself to God. I don't think we really comprehend this. If we did, it would change everything that we do. Now stop and imagine standing before God who knows everything and trying to explain our life to him. This is actually going to happen, so get ready. Get ready by reading and meditating on God's instruction to gain His wisdom. 
Tear yourself away from the world and all it throws at you every day. Stand back from your problems and contemplate God's Word and it'll lift you up above your circumstances and give you the answers you need to handle life. The whole message of this teaching is that there are no excuses. God talk without God acts is outrageously nonsense. Immunah, faith, literally means to take firm action on God's instructions. Tefillah, in Hebrew, means prayer, and it means to self-evaluate. The word for breath in Hebrew is ruach, which also means spirit, so man only becomes a living being when God gives him his spirit. There are no excuses. God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense. Immunah, which means faith in Hebrew, literally means to take firm action on God's instructions. Tefillah, it means prayer in Hebrew, means to self-evaluate. When we pray, we're coming before the throne room of God, the courtroom of God, and it's a great time before the judgment to make sure that we align with His Word. The word for breath in Hebrew is ruach, which also means spirit. So man only becomes a living being when God gives him his spirit. That's the only thing that gives us eternal life. The Hebrew word nefesh means soul, and it also means life. We're to love God with all of our life for all of our life. And this is not loving him for an hour each week at church. It's loving him in everything we do every minute of the day. Now, ma'im is another Hebrew word meaning water, and it comes from the root word mem, meaning chaos. That makes sense because when you consider the Israelites grew up hearing that a flood wiped out the earth, you can understand it. So why then does Jesus insist that his disciples cross the Sea of Galilee during a storm in Mark 6, verse 45? He sent them into chaos. But then he came to help them by walking on top of the water, showing that he is in total control of all chaos. He said, don't worry, I have overcome the world. Are you facing turmoil in your life today? Remember that Jesus is in control of your chaos, and he's calling you to get on top of the chaos, walk on the water with him. Are you ready to let Jesus take control of your chaos? Folks, America has a big problem. God has been removed from public life. Socialism as a religious belief in the political realm is filling the space that was left void when we threw God out. Socialism has never and never will take the place of God, yet many are letting it do that. Socialism cannot produce what the dreamers, the activists, and the political hacks yearn for and advertise and try to convince you of. Political parties cannot be God. Allowing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to take control of your life will produce in you the peace and happiness that socialism will never provide. If you want to prove it, Go down to Venezuela and spend a couple of months in socialism. Venezuelans are strongly warning the United States not to bring socialism into this country because it's horrible. Down there in Venezuela, they have no food. Their rights have been taken away and their business is destroyed. Now, I personally had a person from Venezuela tell me their story about how they went from riches to rags as the government destroyed their business enterprise. They purchased a business here in America and have since sold it and moved to another country because they see the same things going on here that were going on in Venezuela, and it scared the daylights out of them. Socialism thrives in a godless society. It becomes a God for those who live under it. If you prefer socialism, just go to Venezuela or any other communist country. And if you prefer socialism over the peace of God, just stay there. Don't come back and ruin our lives. In all truth, the coming election features a choice between the prosperity that serving God brings and the misery and death that Satan brings. It's about becoming a part of the kingdom of God or bringing in the Antichrist. And this is why it is the most important election 
in the history of our country. Are we going to walk away from God and vote against him? Or are we going to vote for him? Do you want to put in power people who will promise you a way of life and then find out they lied to you and that you've lost your freedom to worship, to speak freely, to prosper and bear arms? Or do you want a way of life that follows the principles of the Creator? And this is what's at stake in this election. In the event socialism is voted into America, it will be too late. It will be the last straw. You see, we're in a war between the real God and the anti-God. If the anti-God is voted in, the government will eliminate the worship of the real God and the national religion will more than likely become Islam. In the midst of the misery that we all experience, we'll have to sneak into an underground church to worship the real God. Marxism is wicked. Socialism is horrible. These aren't my comments. They're the comments from people who have lived under these societies. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. But in connection with the coming of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah and our gathering together to meet Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be easily shaken in your thinking or anxious because of a spirit or a spoken message or a letter supposedly from us claiming that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until after the apostasy has come and the man who separates himself from Torah has been revealed, the one destined for doom. He will oppose himself to everything that people call a God and make an object of worship. He will put himself above them all so that he will sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he himself is God. And of course, we're talking about the Antichrist. So when the one that separates himself from the Torah, the teaching and instructions of God, the Antichrist is revealed, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth as Christians and non-Christians across the world realize they've been conned. So i got to ask you today, will you be one of these? You had the choice and you didn't study God's Word. You voted for the Antichrist, the one who wants to kill babies and destroy the Word of God, and you turned your face from God. You did not heed the Word of the Lord and you followed Satan. The truth is you will still be accountable to God because He is real and He is eternal. All these other things will pass away. He will be victorious over all the wicked acts of Satan and those who follow Satan. Each person will be held accountable to the real God for turning their back on Him and denying Him. There will be no excuses why you didn't honor, obey, and worship the God of Israel and you will be separated from Him forever. Thus saith the word of the Lord and all of God's people said, Amen.